Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. You know, one of the nice things about this job has been um, to have people who have been important in your life and who have played uh, important roles in terms of both professional and personal relationships and have them come uh, as visiting professors and uh, share uh, some of their uh, uh, knowledge that they've acquired over their careers and uh, a, a real good example as Armin Giuliano. Dr. Giuliano is, holds a number of leadership uh, positions with the Cedar sinai Medical Center, but he's uh, well known, internationally known, as uh, a leading breast surgeon. It was uh, he who introduced the concept of sentinel node dissection or sentinel node biopsies in uh, the axillary staging of breast cancer, and thereby saved saved thousands, if not millions, of women uh, aggressive uh, axillary surgery. Um, his biography is in the program, but uh, personally, uh, Armin was my chief resident when I was a medical student and an and intern at, at UCSF. And I remember, really to this day, uh, being so impressed by this chief resident who, was, who could present without notes and, and, and so wonderfully. That was in despair because I thought I could never uh, measure up to being a chief resident at UCSF, and it turns out I never have. So. But it's with uh, real uh, pride, personal pride, and, 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 and friendship that uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Giuliano is going to be our uh, inaugural Donald Morton uh, lecturer in surgical oncology. Armin, welcome to West Virginia. Thank you, Don. <coughs> well, it's always an honor to be a visiting professor. There are many people who could be chosen that give this lecture better than I, but this is a special honor. First to be in the department run by my former intern, and secondly, <laughs> to inaugurate the Donald L. Morton Lecture Series. You know, I had the, the privilege of working for 40 years with Don Morton. Uh, he was my mentor. He was a great teacher. He was my partner when we founded the John Wayne Institute, and he was a friend uh, until the day he died. And I'd just like to tell you a little about this man. He was the smartest man I ever saw up close. He was born here in West Virginia in a, a town, Richwood, which uh, is in the mountains. It's got 2,000 people in the 2010 census. And uh, his dad was a coal miner. He lived in a house that his dad built with no running water, no toilet, no electricity. His mother would tell little Donald, if you want to get out of this, you have to go to school. And Don went to Berea College in Kentucky. I, I don't know if uh, you know about Berea College, but it's a school for underprivileged kids from Appalachia. It was a school founded just after the Civil War to educate uh, minority and the children of slaves and uh, impoverished uh, kids from impoverished families. They charge no tuition, but you have to work. And he could work. Don worked till the day he died. Uh, he went to California after Berea College and attended Berkeley and then uh, Berkeley School of Medicine, UCSF, where he was uh, an intern and resident as well. He did two years at the National Cancer Institute during his residency and developed a lifelong interest in tumor immunology. He went back to the NIH and became a senior investigator and head of the section of tumor immunology at the NCI. He moved to Los Angeles and started the Division of Surgical Oncology. And I was a resident at UCSF in, uh, starting in 1973. And by my third year, I was, uh, wanted to be a vascular surgeon, and it was a pyramidal program where we went from 32 to 8 chiefs, so we lived in constant fear of not graduating. And the chief of surgery called me in the office and said, uh, Armin, uh, next year you're moving to Los Angeles and you're going to do uh, tumor immunology research. And I said, uh, but, but sir, I want to be a vascular surgeon. He said, it doesn't matter, you'll learn a lot about research. I was heartbroken. I met Don Morton. I took a 20% cut in salary from 12000 to 10000 and moved to Los Angeles. Fell in love with oncology and uh, 
He was a tremendous leader. I learned so much about research from him that when I graduated, I joined him in the division of surgical oncology, which was one of the few divisions of surgical oncology in the country. You either went to the UCLA or the NCI. In 1991, <clears throat> Don and I and Ken Ramming and some scientists left UCLA and founded the John Wayne Cancer Institute, a not-for-profit cancer institute in Santa Monica, uh, California. I wasn't sure that we could maintain academics in a very small community hospital, but we managed to do it. Now Don's research accomplishments, I had to shorten this to one slide, it could have been 10. Uh, he used immunotherapy to treat melanoma and it was approved by the FDA and became the first immunotherapy for cancer. It is used in bladder cancer to this day. He uh, received funding for an anti-melanoma vaccine that he worked on his entire career, ultimately patented it, founded a company, took it public, and sold the company. He had a paper net worth one day of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and I went into him and said, Don, you're the, you're the richest guy I know. And he, would st he, he loved West Virginia, and he would sometimes say these West Virginia things that I'd say, huh? And I think that what he said was, uh, you can't eat a bird till you shoot it. Uh, I said, okay, Don. Meaning that he couldn't sell any of his stocks till the phase three trial was done. The phase three, phase three trial failed and Don's stocks became worthless. So he had a very brief uh, feeling of an enormous wealth. Uh, he was the first to do limb salvage for sarcoma. We were doing limb salvage in the early 70s, and he popularized pulmonary resection for metastatic sarcoma and would measure tumor volume. He taught us how to measure tumor volume from chest x-rays, because there were no CTs, and to, to decide who would get uh, pulmonary resection. When I was a fellow, we were perplexed by the problem of melanoma in the mid-thorax, and we were doing prophylactic node dissections. So Don Morton decided to inject radioactive gold into the melanoma and see where it went. And that would be the node dissection we, we did. And he really founded cutaneous lymphocentigraphy, which led to central node biopsy, which changed the practice of surgery for malignant melanoma. And he did innumerable in international trials on malignant melanoma and sentinel node biopsy. Again, sli in numerous slides of awards, uh, Distinguished Research in Tumor Immunology, Society of Surgical Oncology, James Lewing Lectureship, President of a number of uh, uh, surgical societies. He was funded from the NCI for 40 consecutive years. And, uh, and science in 2001 ranked him as the highest peer-reviewed funded NIH clinical investigator. He won the Innovation Award from the American College of Surgeons, which is rarely given. It's given for someone who does something that changes surgery. And Dr. Morton's discoveries have profoundly changed the treatment of human cancer. He was an extraordinary thinker and a creative, creative guy. Worked constantly. When we talked about how you build a division, how you build a department, he was chief of general surgery and surgical oncology at UCLA. I said, Don, what do you, you know? we do? He said, I give the ball to someone I think is good and let him run with it. And I said, what if he drops the ball, Don? He said, I pick it up and give it to someone else. <coughs> he valued work and respected you for hard work. He didn't care your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation. If you could work hard, he respected you. He was most proud, and he would tell me many times, of the young men and women he trained. And he trained about 150 surgical oncologists, many of whom are deans, many of whom are chairman, division chief, and professors of surgery throughout the United States. When he died, his memorial was attended by about 800 people with surgeons from all over the world to pay res last respects to Don. He had a lasting impact that will last for generations through the fellows and students he taught. So it's a great honor for me to speak in his honor and in his memory. And I'd like to share with you how I see the change in lymphadenectomy over the course of centuries. Do you need a 
Yeah. No, is it okay? I'm fine. Oh, it doesn't clip on. It's in my pocket. No, no problem. We're fine. Thank you. In the early part of the 20th century, Lord Moynihan, who was no slouch, he was the founder of the Journal of Surgery, uh, Gynecology, and Obstetrics, said, surgery of malignant disease is not the surgery of organs. It is the anatomy of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system and lymph node dissection by the 20th century was of paramount importance in cancer surgery. How did this start? Well, Hippocrates' medicine in the 5th century BC had four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Four elements, earth, fire, air, and water. Health was a balance of the humors and the elements. By Galen's time, it was theorized that tumors arose from accumulation of one of the humors. There's no room for anatomy in this concept of medicine. Now, we can smile and laugh at this concept of medicine, but it lasted for about 1,500 years. By the Middle Ages, breast cancer was known as an entity that would progress and kill. Surgery was rarely done. It was managed with creams, ointments, and herbs. It was a growing process that embodied evil and death. Cure was religious. But it became apparent that some women with breast cancer would have swelling under the arm. By the Renaissance in the 16th and 17th century, tremendous changes were occurring. And the first textbook of anatomy was published. The body was being viewed as a machine. You could take a cadaver, pull on the bicep tendon, and watch the arm move. A radical change in the thinking about medicine. In the first textbook of anatomy, there's no mention of lymphatics. The lymphatics were unknown. By 1620, a professor of anatomy at Pavia noted lacteals in a vivisection of a live dog that had just eaten. He saw these milk-laden ducks heading up to the thorax. And he searched for communication to the breast because he thought milk was going from the breast to the abdomen. Pequet, a few years later, noted also milk-laden vessels going to the jugular subclavian junction. And he, too, supported the wrong direction of flow of lymphatics. But they still didn't know what these things were. De La Voice Silvius in the 1640s and Thomas Bartholin in the 50s described the lymphatic vessels. So nearly 2,000 years after Hippocrates. And they believed that breast cancer arose in the lymphatics either through acidification, coagulation, or stagnation of lymph. De La Voice Silvius was an amazing doctor he would taste the lymphatic fluid of his patients with cancer. There then grew a tremendous controversy between the humoralists, who believed in the four humors and the elements, and the anatomists. Was it the black bile, or was it the lymphatics that caused cancer? Lymph and lymphatics were not recognized as conduits of cancer but were recognized as the cause of cancer. By the 1780s, the lymphatics of the breast itself had been described, and it was clear that they drained to the axilla as well as to the median, mediastinum. Von Recklinghausen, whose name we all know, was the first to note that lymph vessels ended in lymph nodes. And Sapi, injected mercury into cadavers and could show the anatomy of the lymphatic system. Sapi's uh, injections were famous uh, even now as identifying uh, lymphatic anatomy. He denied, interestingly, that the breasts ever drained to the internal mammary chain. So by the 19th century, there was an extraordinary confluence of events in surgery and in medicine, anesthesia antisepsis, 
the study of histology and pathology, sterilization, studies of anatomy, studies of outcome, what happens if you do this operation to someone. And the first cancer ward was started at Middlesex Hospital. Bill Roth, the famous GI surgeon, was actually a breast surgeon who studied the microscopic pathology of different types of breast cancer. And he was the first to say that it originated in the epithelium and invaded the stroma. It began locally and then spread. He articulated that lymphatics are the roots of metastasis and they go to the lymph nodes, the pleura, and the diaphragm through the lymphatics. Bill Roth would often remove lymph nodes when he did a mastectomy. This principle in 1863, articulated by Verkau, is the principle by which we have practiced surgery for 150 years. That is, the lymph gland collects hurtful ingredients absorbed from the breast cancer and thereby, for a time, affords protection to the body. In the 1880s, Heidenhahn performed microscopic studies of mastectomies. And he saw that tumor lymphatics emerged from the posterior wall of the breast and went right through the muscle. He proposed in continuity resection of lymph nodes and breast to remove these conduits and remove the disease filters without transecting the tumor in the lymphatics. Bill Roth, Verkow, and Gross all performed some degree of resection of the pectoralis major during a mastectomy. Hall said, studied with Bill with Roth. In 1882, he routinely removed the pectoralis major and minor and reported the procedure in 1894. Timing is everything. Ten days later, Willie Meyer reported the same procedure. No one has ever heard of Willie Meyer. <coughs> so if you think of what Halstead knew, the lymphatics were critical in the management of breast cancer. Breast cancer spreads via the lymphatics to the lymph nodes. <clears throat> the lymph nodes are filters. When the filters are blocked, the tumor spreads through or around them. Remove the filters, remove the conduits to get a cure. He said no negative patients who develop metastases have unappreciated nodal disease. Halstead knew that he had a problem. He was aware of metastases to the supraclavicular nodes, to the neck, and the internal mammary. So he then extended his operation to the neck and would often remove the clavicle. Then he realized that more patients were dying from his operation than he was curing, and he abandoned this. But he always recognized that he had an intellectual flaw. He was not removing all the conduits and all the filters. So what had to be done was figure out a way to remove more of the conduits and more of the filters. And Stibbe, in the 20th century, did cadaver resections to examine the resectability of internal mammary lymph nodes. He realized that you could do a lymphadenectomy without entering the pleura. Many surgeons began to do internal mammary node dissection. But it was really urban who figured out a way to do an incontinuity resection where you don't transect the conduits, but you remove the lymph nodes and the breast and the muscle all in one piece. The ultimate Halsteadian. Now, I'm not here to malign him. He took the best science of his time and made an operation fit the scientific theories. And that's what we all must do. What do we know about science? How do we apply this to our patient in the operating room? He did that. Unfortunately, the science has changed. It couldn't go anywhere but down.
Other advances in the 20th century were competing with this anatomic theory of cancer spread. The scientific method itself, how do you investigate things? Laboratory, clinical research, the first randomized trial was not done until the late 1940s in Great Britain to examine a tuberculosis treatment. There was better knowledge of the biology of the metastases, statistical analysis, screening, earlier cancer detection, adjuvant therapies, and these all affected our understanding of the biology of breast cancer. There was demonstration that tumor could embolize in blood vessels without going to the lymphatics. Even if you didn't remove the pectoralis major, there weren't many chest wall recurrences. And there were many recurrences in patients who were node negative. You started to question in the 50s and 60s the sole root of metastasis as being lymph nodes. And then Bernie Fisher, who was a tremendous leader in breast cancer right here from Pittsburgh, uh, did some experiments. He catheterized the thoracic duct of a rat. He injected radio-labeled tumor cells into the jugular vein. So he had venous embolization of tumor. And he collected the lymphatic duct fluid and saw that dead cells and free isotope got there immediately, circulated right into the lymphatics. But live tumor cells transverse the capillary bed within 12 to 24 hours. The live tumor cell would appear in the lymphatics. He could take the lymph, filter out the tumor cells, inject it into the rat, and cause cancer. So live tumor cells went directly from the bloodstream into the thoracic duct. He did another very interesting experiment. He cannulated the efferent and efferent lymphatics of a popliteal lymph node. He then infused the afferent lymphatic at very low pressure and collected the efferent lymph. So on the other side of the node, he collected the fluid that passed through the node. And what he found was tumor cells passed directly through the node. The node did not filter out tumor. Verkau's concept of the node as a filter was disproven by this simple experiment 100 years later. And you could only conclude from Fisher's work that there was no distinction between lymphatic and hematogenous roots of metastases. So Dr. Fisher did the first randomized trial in breast cancer surgery. This is a tremendously important trial, BO4. It examined the extent of mastectomy it was based on his studies of nodal function. He recognized the value of prospective clinical trials. He recognized the value of cooperative group structure and how to get a large number of patients into a study. He was an extraordinarily personable leader. When you'd go to an NSPP, NSABP meeting where Bernie Fisher spoke, it was a religious experience. And this study, was a tremendously important study. Women with clinically negative nodes were randomized to a total mastectomy and nodal irradiation to a radical mastectomy. So two arms treated the lymph nodes. One arm was a total mastectomy with no lymph node treatment. These were women with positive nodes. We'll just look at this. Three arms, two with nodal treatment, one without no point in 25 years of follow-up was there a difference in survival. And these were big tumors. It was not mammographically detected. They were palpable. There was no adjuvant therapy. There was no tamoxifen. Surgery versus no surgery. Leave the lymph nodes in or take them out. Irradiate them or leave them in. It didn't matter. Well, this study gave Fisher credibility to the lack of a role of radical local therapy and decreasing role of lymphadenectomy in the treatment of breast cancer. Blake Cady, professor of Har at Harvard, would say lymph node metastases are indicators, not governors, of distant metastases. That is, if the tumor had the ability to spread to the lymph node, it had the ability to spread through the bloodstream and go somewhere else. 
The problem was that this study's impact was ignored primarily, I believe, because we started to see the value of systemic chemotherapy for high risk, parentheses, node positive women. So you had to do a node dissection to see if they could get chemotherapy to improve their survival. It wasn't the node dissection that improved survival. It was the selection of patients for chemotherapy. There is no study yet that has shown node dissection has improved survival in any tumor system as far as I'm concerned. So nothing changed in the management of patients, surgical management of patients with breast cancer. So in the laboratory, Don Morton was doing these studies, and we got so good at lymphocentigraphy that you could see a single track going to a single lymph node. And Don said, well, what if you just remove that lymph node in melanoma? And he said, why don't you try it in breast cancer? It'll be good. So I tried it in breast cancer. 1991, I started doing it, and I did the melanoma technique, and it, and it didn't work. So I went back to him, I said, Don, forget it. The lymphatics of the breast are unlike the lymphatics of the skin. It just, it'll never work. So I stopped doing it for, for a number of months. And a fellow came on my service. I oh, will confess, over the years, I've learned more from my fellows than I taught them. I owe them a great debt of gratitude. So Danny Kurgan, who's now professor of surgery at uh, University of Nevada, said, well, Dr. G, why don't you like maybe it doesn't work the way melanoma works. Why don't you design an experiment where we change the dose, change the time, do this and that, and okay. And then it was a eureka moment. The first time we saw a blue lymph node was, oh my God, a eureka moment. <clears throat> so 1991, in the initial study, we did 174 consecutive patients, anybody, locally advanced disease, big matted nodes, and we identified the lymph sentinel node in only 66% of the cases poor patient selection, no technique. We were changing the te te technique uh, weekly. But when you identified it, it was highly predictive of nodal involvement. So we got to a point where we could do it pretty regularly, where it really worked. And we knew that if you had matted lymph nodes, it wouldn't work. And I'd see cases with a cancerous node and the blue dye just going right around it to a little tiny negative node. And we originally called that a false positive, but you could see that the big nodes wouldn't, palpable nodes wouldn't take it up. So we improved our technique. We improved our selection. We did 107 consecutive patients. We identified 94% with blue dye alone. And when we identified it, it was 100% predictive of the nodal status. No false negatives. So. I would start to give the lecture on sentinel node biopsy and nobody believed it. Nobody believed there were complications to the operation and the, the Society of Surgical Oncology sent the president out to watch me operate to make sure I wasn't making this all up. Uh, and then people said, well, the problem is you take one lymph node out, you make six slices, you find a little tiny metastasis, you take the rest of the axle out, you make one slice, Stain it with H and E. You don't do any micro dissections. You don't do any immunohistochemistry. What you've done is identified metastases by a more intense evaluation. So we decided we would prove the principle. And we did that by ultra staging non sentinel nodes. This was a tremendous amount of work that my pathologist, Rod Turner, did. So we do a Sentinel node biopsy, take the node out, put it in a jar, complete the axillary dissection. If the sentinel node was tumor-free by immunohistochemistry, by h &E, we did immunohistochemistry. If it was tumor-free by immunohistochemistry, we did immunohistochemistry and serial section on all non-sentinel nodes. So they had the same extensive workup that the sentinel node had. And what did we find? We took 157 H&E negative sentinel nodes, immunohistochemistry identified 10 that we called node positive. From the node negative 147 patients, we got nearly 1,100 lymph nodes that with H&E had no metastases and with immunohistochemistry had one 
with tiny isolated tumor cells. I hate that lymph node. In 1995, we abandoned axillary dissection at John Wayne Cancer Institute. When I presented this at ASCO, there was a, a, an audible uh, shriek from the audience. But it wasn't as bad as when I presented it at a John Wayne cocktail party to a John Wayne attorney. I said, hey, you won't believe this. This is the first place in the world to give up axillary dissection and breast cancer. He choked on his drink. He said, what are you going to do if someone recurs or has a problem? You're going to say, you're the only person, this is the only place in the world that knows this? So we then devised a 15-page consent form and did a study. We did 125 consecutive patients with no axillary dissection if the central node was tumor-free. There were no nodal recurrences. So we concluded that it's feasible and safe and we did away with the uh, informed consent for the research project. But there had been no randomized study, and this procedure was taking place throughout the U.S. The randomized study was done by, first one was done by Veronese with 500 patients, randomized to central node or central node plus axillary dissection. All node positive women got an axillary dissection. No difference in recurrences but less morbidity, removing one lymph node than removing 20 or so. We were finding this a lot in these lymph nodes, little tiny metastases detected by immunohistochemistry. So we reasoned, if the node is negative, we don't need an axillary dissection. What if the node is a little positive? Was Halstead right, the node negative women who recur had undetected tiny metastases. The literature was very confusing. So we asked the question, <coughs> what is the significance of these small metastases? If you don't need axillary dissection for patients with tumor-free central nodes, do you need it for those with micrometastases or isolated tumor cells? And we did this with the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, where we did a purely prognostic study a central node and bone marrow micrometastases in women with early breast cancer. Sam Wells was just starting the ACOSOG, American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, and wanted a study that would get surgeons in the community to do research. Only a three or four percent of American cancer patients are in clinical studies. Unlike pediatrics, where a large number of patients are, how did we get surgeons to participate and this was one of the studies that um, I came up with for Sam. Very easy. Patients having breast conserving therapy is lumpectomy, gets a sentinel node biopsy and bilateral iliac crest aspiration while they're asleep so it doesn't hurt. They wake up with little band-aids on their uh, iliac crest. If the sentinel node is negative, no axillary treatment. Breast whole breast radiation, systemic therapy based on the primary tumor. The sentinel node examined by H&E at the institution, sent to Rich Cody's lab at USC for immunohistochemistry. This study was the first study that we did that was considered unethical by many doctors because you're not telling the patients that they had metastases. My argument was we don't know these are real metastases, but not everyone agreed with me. When you looked at the survival, this is H&E positive, okay, so they have bona fide metastases, they do worse than H&E negative, which did worse than immunohistochemistry positive. Not statistically significant difference, but you got a little bump right there at the end. So no difference between immunohistochemistry positive and H&E negative. NSABP did a similar study and they found a tiny difference in, occult, uh, in overall survival with occult metastases, a little over 1%. Their study was different uh, in that the occult metastases could have been a macrometastasis that was missed on sentinel node. And I think that may be the difference. But they concluded in their paper, uh, Weaver concluded that there was a slight difference, but it was not clinically relevant 
and didn't warrant treatment based on that finding. Both recommend against routine IHC. Almost every institution I visit, including my own, still does routine IHC. Both found the survival outcomes not clinically relevant and that you shouldn't base adjuvant systemic therapy on the findings of a micrometastasis or isolated tumor cells. And most importantly, central node biopsy alone could replace formal axillary dissection for node negative patients with isolated tumor cells or micrometastases. Well, tumors are smaller now than they were in the past. A lot of tumors are non-palpable. Fewer patients have node positive disease. The sentinel node is often the only involved lymph node. Breast conserving therapy with whole breast radiation treats the low axilla. Adjuvant systemic therapy is almost always given for node positive women. That begs the question, can axillary lymph node dissection be omitted for some patients who are sentinel node positive? So our hypothesis was that removing an h and &E involved central node would achieve the same local regional control and survival as a completion lymphadenectomy for women with node positive disease. And we did this with Z11. Patients with a positive central node undergoing breast conserving therapy were randomized to axillary dissection or no further surgery. They were treated with whole breast irradiation and systemic adjuvant therapy. This study was extraordinarily controversial. I have a drawer of hate mail uh, where people said, this is so unethical, you're leaving cancer in patients untreated. And I, and I told Sam Wells, this was a no-brainer, Sam. This will be easy because the NSABP did BO4 30 years ago with no adjuvant systemic therapy. How can anyone object? Everyone objected. You couldn't have third field radiation. You couldn't radiate the nodes. The metastases had to be real metastases detected by H and E. You couldn't have matted nodes. And as we started the study, more and more people objected. We could see that this was going to be a problem. So we backed off a little on the criteria. If you saw a lot of lymph nodes, if the surgeon opened the axle and saw a lot of lymph nodes, you could bi biopsy three. And if they were involved, you could take the patient out. We took, did not treat mastectomy patients, because when you do a mastectomy, you often get the low axilla, and that would confound the results. And that was a major criticism of BO4. Some of the patients had a few lymph nodes removed. But basically, it's a modern repeat of BO4, which left positive nodes in the axilla. The study population was pretty straightforward breast cancer, 55 years, uh, mostly T1 tumors, mostly infiltrating ductal, and mostly ER positive. The study was closed early. The target accrual was 18, 1900, and we had to close it at 900 because good news for the patients, bad news for the doctors, nobody was dying, and the accrual was too, too low. Median number of lymph nodes removed in an axillary dissection far greater than a central node biopsy, no surprise. But this is the figure that really boggles the surgeon's mind. It makes it hard to accept. If the patient had an axillary dissection, 27% had additional nodes. That means in a randomized study that in a central node biopsy alone, 27% had additional nodes untreated with surgery, unremoved left cancer in these patients. This study bothers me. <clears throat> but what happened? Sentinel node biopsy, 1.8 local recurrence, regional nodal recurrence, 0.5% with an axillary dissection, 0.9%, under 1% recurrence with untreated axillary lymph nodes. Median follow-up, 6.3 years, very few regional recurrences. 97% had adjuvant systemic therapy, either chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, or both. Look at survival. Once again, survival favored central node only. No statistically significant difference. 
No difference in overall survival. You cannot help but conclude from that randomized study that sentinel node biopsy can replace formal axillary dissection. And it turns out that it's appropriate for at least 80% of the patients upon whom we ap uh, operate. I put that 80% in there because four or five studies have looked at the applicability of Z11 to patient care, and at least 80% of node positive women are eligible to be treated with no axillary dissection. Study was greatly, greatly criticized. Uh, short follow-up was inadequate. Patients were old, ER positive. Didn't reach target accrual. Single study. Let's look at these for a moment. Let's look at the follow-up. Regional recurrence happens relatively early in breast cancer, two, three years. In BO4, the median time to axillary recurrence was 14.8 months. A study by Greco with untreated axillary treated with tamoxifen alone, 30 months to axillary recurrence. Martelli with a similar study, 33 months. Z10, 19 months. Z11 had 76 months of follow-up. Most axillary recurrences had to occur within that 76 months. Well, mostly ER positive patients, <clears throat> mostly old patients. Well, breast cancer occurs in postmenopausal women. It's mostly ER positive. But we looked at uh, ER negative. First of all, ER negative patients tend to recur early. They don't tend to recur locally. They tend to recur with distant disease and die. Probably fewer patients have nodal metastases, and fewer patients have a large number of nodal metastases. When we did an unplanned analysis of ER and PR, here's ER, PR negative, axillary dissection, 82% survival, no axillary dissection, 85% survival. Young women have a higher recurrence in the breast, but not necessarily in the axilla. Sentinel node biopsy, four in breast recurrences, one nodal recurrence, no different from the axillary dissection. This was the most difficult uh, criticism to deal with, and it was difficult for me because I don't understand the statistics well enough, and difficult for surgeons because surgeons don't understand the statistics well enough. It's a non inferiority trial. A non inferiority trial with a low p value means there's no difference. So this study had a p-value of 008, which in my mind means if you do it a thousand times, eight times out of a thousand, by chance alone, axillary dissection will be better than sentinel node biopsy. So low p-value means no different. So the study was closed early. It was unblinded, and holy mackerel, it's got a p of 008. It was significant. Reaching target accrual is not necessary for statistical significance. Target accrual is the number that if you hit it and you don't have a statistically significant finding, you can't say the study wasn't large enough. But if you're trusting drug A against drug B and your target accrual is 100 in each arm, the first 50 patients on drug A die, what do you do? You don't go to target accrual. Well, it's the only study. I'm not changing my practice based on one study. That's not true. B04, 1970s. Modern randomized trials. Martelli, International Breast Cancer Study Group, axillary dissection versus observation. Axillary dissection versus radiation. Radiation versus observation. Axillary recurrences on the order of 1, 2, or 3%. Difference in survival? Nothing. B32, done around the same time as uh, Z11, looked at their patients with occult sentinel node involvement. So these patients had micrometastasis usually in the sentinel node. 316 patients had metastasis, 300 with dot and did not. It was a randomized study, no difference in survival or recurrence in those two groups of patients, a contemporary study. International Breast Cancer Study Group, 
uh, Z11 with micrometastases. They only looked at micrometastases because they thought we were crazy to look at macrometastases. Same number of patients, same kind of patients, no difference in any measure of survival or axillary recurrence. The United States Preventive Task Force Services Task Force says the highest level of evidence is level one, at least one randomized clinical trial. Five randomized clinical trials show no survival impact with omission of axillary dissection. Yet this study is, is ignored. Surgeons continue to do axillary dissection. What has happened is also is that our understanding of the biology has changed. There are many studies that look at nodal, nodal uh, look at tumor. Uh, Mutations. This is one that I'm most familiar with. I have no, I have no disclosures for this lecture. I've, this company has never given me a cup of coffee. They should. Uh, <laughs> so they look at nodal mut mutations, and if there are a lot of mut not nodal, they look at tumor mutations. They have a lot of these mutations. There's a high recurrence, and they call it a recurrence score, the number of mutations. If there are low number of mutations, they have a low recurrence. So looking at the primary tumor itself, you can predict outcome. You can also predict whether the tumor is going to respond to chemotherapy and you're going to improve survival with chemotherapy by looking at the mutations in the primary tumor. Interestingly, it doesn't correlate very well with things we like to think of. Age, grade, tumor size, but it's the strongest predictor of outcome and response to chemotherapy. What does that tell me? Genotype trumps phenotype. It's in the biology of the tumor, not in the removal of the lymph nodes. If you look at local regional recurrence, something that we are interested in as surgeons, recurrence score with oncotype, 2.86 hazard ratio, P001. Look at these other things we think of, chemotherapy, 0.8. Age, 0.8. Number of nodes, 2.8, almost as good as recurrence score, but not quite. Operation, nothing was quite as good as recurrence score. Genotype trumps phenotype. So you can predict local and distant recurve, you can predict survival, you can re predict response to chemotherapy. Oncotype only does ER positive patients. There are other studies, other uh, systems not as well studied that can look at ER negative. It may predict recurrence of DCIS and may predict response to radiation in early D in DCIS. There are other genomic analysis. I think genomic analysis will replace axillary lymphadenectomy, will replace sentinel node biopsy. Let's just talk for a moment that you don't have to resect involved lymph nodes. How can that not affect survival? That bothers me. It bothers every surgeon I talk to. It's the emotional response we all get. With this is what we do. We remove cancer. And you're telling me I don't have to remove the cancer and the patient's going to do just as well as if I remove them? Come on, what's wrong with you, people think? Well, there's something called site-specific metastases. And the biologists are way ahead of us in their understanding of metastases. But we as surgeons understand site-specific metastases. <coughs> Some tumors go to cer certain sites. Sarcoma tends to go to lungs. Thyroid cancer, children with thyroid cancer have a tremendously high incidence of nodal metastases, but very few die of thyroid cancer. You can take ascites from a woman with ovarian cancer, pump that tumor-laden ascites right into her venous circulation. They never get pulmonary metastases. You can take a melanoma, inject it into a rat, take the melanoma out of the lung, it goes throughout the body, keep injecting it, do it three or four times, and you get a melanoma that only goes to the lung. The soil, soil seal hypothesis, no, oh, thank you very much, Don, very kind, <coughs> is true. There's a site-specific metastasis. The microenvironment interacts with the tumor cell. And I believe that the interaction 
creates a Darwinian selection. So the site works on the tumor and says, well, this tumor has got the material to grow here. And it knocks out the cells that don't grow there. And the ones that grow are specific for that site, for lymph nodes, for lung, wherever it may be. Here's an example that's actually pretty well studied. You can take cancer cells which have certain receptors, put them in bone marrow, and the bone marrow selects out only those cells that have the receptors to grow in that bone marrow. So is it possible that the cells in a lymph node only have the ability to grow in that lymph node and not in other sites? So I think we have to deal with a genomic theory in breast cancer. The genomic makeup determines the outcome. If you're a child of the 60s, you remember when biology was destiny? Well, it is. Breast cancer cells circulate early, but lack the mutations necessary for clinical metastases. The primary tumor continues to develop mutations. It's important to treat that primary tumor. Local environment affects and shapes, selects a natural selection on the mutations on the cells with the right mutations. Most nodal metastases lack the machinery to grow elsewhere. So many nodal metastases are effectively treated or clinically insignificant. Biology is destiny. The tumor genomic makeup determines where it's going to grow. So let's just look at undescended lymph nodes and what happens if you don't dissect the lymph nodes. BO4, the randomized arm axillary dissection had 40% positive nodes. No treatment, no radiation, no tamoxifen, no chemotherapy. 15% became clinically relevant. Okay. 2005, Martelli, 23% in the randomized arm positive nodes. Tamoxifen, 1.8, 10% be claimed clinically relevant. International Breast Cancer Study Group, the randomized to remove, 28% positive, 3% nodal recurrence. Z11, 27% positive, 0.9. None of these studies had a difference in survival. These undissected tumors did not progress. You have to conclude that all nodal metastases do not progress. All nodal metastases do not metastasize. Any surgeons old enough remember when we did internal mammary node dissections? Look at this. If the axle is negative, the internal mammary node is positive somewhere between 5 and 15% of the time. We don't remove them anymore. If the axle is positive, 30 to 60% of the time the nodes are positive, we don't remove them. Randomized study, Halstead radical versus extended radical. Look at that. Whether you remove them or not, didn't matter. 20% positive. This study was done by Veronese in the age before chemotherapy, no radiation. Untreated, internal mammary nodes did not affect survival. We can somehow ignore these lymph nodes. It doesn't bother us but we can't seem to give up on axillary lymph nodes. So <clears throat> it seems to me that we have to start to think about genomic analysis and that surgery is probably essential to control the early primary, which will develop new mutations, which will lead to metastases to various organs. But there's a low probability of nodal metastases metastasizing because they lack the genetic material. So here we are in 2015, what can we say definitively, not me fantasizing about genomic analysis? Well, we can say that most women with invasive cancer don't require an axillary dissection. We can say there's no diminution in staging accuracy or survival with the decreasing use of lymphadenectomy. And I believe we are in a new era in our understanding and treatment of breast cancer. 
And I think that we're in an era just as revolutionary as the anatomic studies of Vesalius or the advent of the microscope. We're moving from gross anatomy to genomic anatomy. And the future is in the hands of the residents in this room and the medical students who are going to take this and figure out how to cure cancer. Not in the old guys like me who are going to don't have the uh, background or, or, or training to understand this very well. This is the future, the genomic analysis of cancer. And it's all in the hands of the young, young men and women in this room. And thank you for this extraordinary honor of being here, seeing my old co-resident and being the inaugural uh, speaker for my friend and colleague, Don Morton. Thank you.